Hello, cadets. Welcome to Leaders 411, the COVID-19 version. You know, normally we send you out into the world to meet a bunch of wonderful professional folks, but this year uh, they are coming to you virtually. I'm very, very pleased to have a uh, personal friend and a very interesting and accomplished uh, medical doctor and entrepreneur, uh, Dr. Ed O'Brien. Um, Dr. O'Brien, I'm going to have you uh, explain a little bit about your position at MUSC, walk these cadets through your, your professional career path, starting as an undergraduate, moving forward through graduate schools, and uh, just, just give them a, a five minute background or, or however long you need to explain kind of where you are and how you got there, please. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is going to be, this is a great class. I wish I had something like this um, <laughs> going through. But uh, my background is, well, currently at MUSC, I'm the executive director of MUSC Health Solutions which is a rapid commercialization innovation uh, platform, kind of like Skunk Works, uh, but for MUSC. I'm also the chief medical officer for business health at MUSC. Uh, I also founded and am chief medical officer for One World Health, which is a nonprofit 501c3 that builds hospitals throughout the world. Built about 15 hospitals in uh, Uganda, Burundi, Nicaragua, um, Honduras, and a few other places. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I guess through my career uh, pathway is I went to uh, from originally from Florence, South Carolina. I was able to escape Florence. Some of you might be from there. Um, <laughs> lots of us escaped to Charleston, but uh, uh, escaped Florence uh, actually uh, in high school. And I went to a boarding school called Woodbury. It's an all, all boys school. Um, so I have some idea of what you may be experiencing. I know it's not all boys at Citadel, but um, it's a high uh, percentage. And then I went to Davidson uh, for undergrad. Uh, pretty good school uh, outside of Charlotte. Uh, Steph Curry's home. That's all anybody knows Davidson for. <laughs> but it was a liberal arts school. And actually, I didn't major in anything scientific. I uh, majored in religion, uh, East Asian religion to be specific. I uh, was always interested in that. And I just figured the science would, would kind of come. I wanted to be an international businessman uh, while I was in college and uh, didn't realize I didn't really know what I was doing. And Davidson's not a great place to go if you want to be an international businessman. So I stuck it out with some of the science classes, took the MCAT, and came to MUSC, uh, where I completed my uh, MD. Um, when I was at MUSC, I just did residency and I ended up working in the emergency department. I worked for about six or seven years in the Veterans Hospital. Um, and uh, a cool story about that, Ralph H. Johnson is the Veterans Hospital name over here in, in Charleston. And Ralph H. Johnson was my uncle's private in the Marine Corps. My uncle was a, a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And uh, Ralph H. Johnson was the private who saved my uncle's life. Uh, my uncle's wow. uh, uh, name is Cleve McCleary. He's a, he's a motivational speaker, actually still speaks. He's spoken at Citadel several times. Um, and so that hospital has a, has a lot of significance for me. So he's the, he's the Marine with the eye patch. Yep, one eye, he lost, yeah, he, he's undergone 40 surgeries, has one eye, one arm left, but he's still run marathons since then. He's an amazing, never complains. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. Oh, okay, yeah, he is. so you, what did you do at the VA? So the VA, I was in the emergency department. I was an emergency yeah. department attending there uh, for a while. Uh, and then uh, transitioned over. While, while I was in med school, um, I went on a medical mission trip. Um, and then it really kind of changed my life. I was able to see the way that other people lived in the rest of the world, especially in terms of, of medical care and, and what they really just didn't have access to. You know, you can't just dial 911 anywhere else in the world and expect somebody to show up. So that really kind of tugged at my heart and, um, you know, uh, really at my soul, I should say, more than anything else. And so I thought there has to be a way to form something that is, um, can take these kind of short-term medical mission trips that do some good, but at the end of the day, some people argue they don't do good, you know, when churches go and, and things like that, but could marry those into some sort of long-term sustainable solution. So I founded in around 2008, uh, what was then called the Palmetto Medical Initiative, later uh, changed names to One World Health. And now, like I said, we've built the hospitals all around the world. We see about 250,000 patients a year uh, for free or no cost and are self-sustainable. Um, so we have 100% sustainability. Uh, we fundraise for our projects. We can get into that later. But I was doing that along, along at the VA, took a couple little, little stops in some other fields and then just realized I, I really wanted to continue an entrepreneurial kind of uh, pathway. So I uh, came over to MUSC, back full-time to MUSC, uh, in around 2013 or so um, in their emergency department and took a dual role where I founded a global health fellowship at MUSC, founded a global health department uh, within the uh, uh, Department of Emergency Medicine, recruited fellows. Then I started a fellowship uh, for PAs. 
And I took over the medical director of the PA program at MUSC, which is a great program, by the way, if anybody's interested. We have a few Citadel graduates there. Uh, and then moved over to um, take over the uh, uh, rapid commercialization innovation and chief medical officer position. So that's my long-winded. First of all, that, that, that's an amazing, what I'm hearing is, you know, one, one person, one uh, professional here is basically an emergency room doctor. That's the emergency department. Uh, you're developing channels inside MUSC uh, to include PA, which is physician's assistant. It's, uh, it's basically short of being a doctor, but it's a very uh, strong professional level of service in the medical field. And then external to MUSC, you're developing hospitals around the world through One World Health. So, you know, that, that, that entrepreneurial mindset, spinning all those plates, and I, I happen to know you're a father of a couple of children and a husband, uh, you know, that, that is an awful lot to balance. Um, you know, I heard a little bit in the backstory of how these ideas developed. Um, you know, how, first of all, how do you, how do you balance? It sounds like you're leading multiple initiatives. How do you balance your attention and make sure you don't burn out and make sure that uh, each, each thing you're trying to run is, is run at a very high quality? Sure. That's a good point. And I forgot to mention that I'm actually completing my MBA right now uh, at Tennessee. I forgot to mention that. So because I've really, I guess, I guess to answer your question, how I deal with the burnout stuff, I've always wanted to have um, a big impact and I've wanted to be involved in things that have a big impact. And so, um, you know, moving into a, a higher administrative position and then having the MBA so that I would really understand the business, what's going on behind the business, you know, to make things sustainable or to impact more patients or, or whatever, uh, uh, really became important to me. And so I really wanted to commit to do that. Um, I actually looked at the Citadel program, but I was nervous about being around all you undergrads who just, just had finance and everything. And I hadn't had it in 10 years. I was worried y'all would make me look dumb. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, burnout, how do I manage burnout? I mean, it's, you know, I'll be honest with you with COVID. So my department has been in charge of setting up the um, testing sites for COVID uh, throughout the United States. I'm also director of telemedicine uh, services. So, you know, all the online screenings we've done for a couple hundred thousand people, all that kind of stuff, uh, moving into the telemedicine uh, testing for the, for the drive-through testing centers, all the testing that you guys have had done for COVID at the Citadel came through me. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been as close to burnout as I've ever been, I'll say right now with juggling all the plates and then COVID it's kind of lumped on top of all that uh, and the stress it's, it's created, but you know, I never really believe in burnout much until this. And I've kind of always been a yes person where I'd say yes to whatever new task came my way. It could just be ADD. I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and now I'm starting to realize that it's a real thing. So, uh, I'm having to kind of really delegate, um, and get the right team beside you. And delegate. You can't do things on your own. Nothing I've done has been on my own. Um, and so that's the biggest thing I've learned from this semi burnout state uh, <laughs> is uh, teamwork and delegation. That's right. I mean, that is, that is absolutely critical. Your bucket just starts filling up to the maximum. And you can't handle it anymore. You got to go find some high quality buckets and train them up and get them in place. I mean, it's just, I think that is uh, a lesson of anyone who is basically wants to serve and is also has an ambition to lead. You know, you said you've always wanted to do big things. I think that's a very common thread at the Citadel. I think that's one of the reasons cadets attend the Citadel. They want to achieve their full potential and they, they see a lot of potential and they want to test themselves. And so thinking about, you know, thinking about them sitting in that classroom at age 20, 22, or now sitting in front of the screen at age 22 ish. And, uh, uh, as you know, a third of our cadets go into the military, but of course, many serve a four-year commitment and then they move into the private sector. Many go into engineering, health, law, medicine, but helping them think about, wow, you know, just because I, I go down one professional track, you know, you, you, you are a doctor, you are a doctor, um, and you are an emergency room doctor, and now you're in innovation and entrepreneurship at MUSC, also continuing uh, lifelong learning as an MBA. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're what, 37-ish? Oh, uh, well, thank you. For, You're welcome. You're uh, welcome. 42. <laughs> I'm 46, so. Uh, no, but thinking about, you know, the fact that, wow, you're going back to these graduate degrees, um, even though you already are an accomplished person. Um, it's not like you wanted to get a degree early on, like a medical degree, to build a career on top of. You have built a career, and in order to uh, reinforce what you, where you want to go from here, you're going back for more education. That's, a, that's pretty solid, considering all the things you're doing. Right. And I'll say, you know, having seen, I've been alongside Citadel graduates pretty much my whole career, 
Um, I think it, it's in, it, there's two ways it can go. <laughs> you can rebel against the Citadel way and then, you know, that happens, that happens everywhere. But I've really noticed that there's such a great uh, alumni network uh, within the Citadel. I've also noticed that, you know, the Citadel graduates who are in my med school program, Citadel graduates who come through the uh, PA program uh, and that we employ at MUSC, either in fellowships or through, our, through the MHA, a lot of Citadel graduates seem to come up to the MHA program as well. Uh, they fit in really well. I, I think um, it's a great education. So wait, you know, kind of where you're sitting right now. If you told me, there's, I think there's two kinds of people. I think there's people who, who have a career path kind of, uh, I don't know, semi-planned out at an early age. And they say, listen, I want to be an emergency room doctor and that's what I'm going to do. And they do that for 40 years and they're happy with that. And that's great. And I, or they want to be a banker or whatever it is. Um, and there's other kind of people who, if you told me, they ask me what I'm gonna do in three years. I have no clue. You know, you say, why would you be at MUSC doing the same thing you're doing now? I say, nah, it's unlikely. You know, I mean, I've sold, I sell a house every four years. You know, I, there's just some people who just don't think I, you ask me what a five and 10 year plan is no chance. Mm -hmm. um, so I just like to take the opportunity and run with it. And there's people like that. And so if that is you don't feel bad that you don't have some sort of grand plan, you may be the guy who, never has a grand plan, but ends up wildly successful because of not having a grand plan. I just, I just don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself too early on is what I would say. I agree. That's, it's very personality dependent and knowing yourself and learning to know yourself as a young person um, and knowing how your personality fits, you know, like we, we already know, um, like I said, a third of our cadets go in the military, they're going to find out whether that's a good fit for them or not. Other folks going to go into professional careers. But I think that idea of just blooming where you're planted and not being so, uh, concerned in year one or two or out of school, have I, am I set for life on the path? Because right. what I've heard from you is all of this school, all this medical training, even when you're in college, you didn't know, hey, I didn't know for sure I was going to go to medical school. Then once I, I know I'm going to be a doc, an MD, a doctor, that doesn't necessarily preclude you from doing all of these other things within your organization and outside of your organization um, to fulfill um, what it is that you want to fully become as a person. I think that's a very valuable um, lesson for some of these cadets who are just, you know, they share in common. They're very hardworking. They know, they know they can survive a, a difficult grind right. and um, they know that they're capable of working hard and accomplishing great things. So where, where do you set the mark? And so, like you said, some people set the mark like, okay, I'm going to be an architect and I'm going to be, I'm going to live here in Charleston or wherever for the next 45 years as an architect. But it's okay to, to set intermediate goals or to, to not, even, not even know off the bat where the path is going to take you. I mean, I, right. I can relate to that, as you know, and, yes. um, <laughs> and I just think it's fantastic. So t talk to me a little bit about how One World Health developed. How did you, how, you know, you talked about the seed of the idea, and, and you said that mission trips go down, and, you know, they, they have an impact, but it's not really necessarily an organized or lasting impact. Um, in fact, I've, I've heard the word um, missionary tourism sort of as a, mm -hmm. as a the negative connotation, but you, you work to, how did you formalize that? How did you turn that from an idea into an actual operation? Sure. Well, I'll say in a general sense, I like to use the term like walking through uh, open doors. Um, so, you know, if a door closes, another one may open. Um, so that's been part of the journey, but I'll say this, when I went on my first medical mission trip, it was medical tourism or missionary tourism or whatever you want to call it. And some of the people call it parachute medicine or you parachute in, give some medicine, and then you disappear. Um, it's great, you know, if you're the person getting treated that day, you're helped, of course, but that's not really something, it's not sustainable, right? So if that were happening in the United States, you know, it's not, it's just not something that happens. So um, I thought to myself, gosh, there's a lot of churches out there and kind of nonprofits or whatever trying to have an impact, but it's really not what they do. Um, you know, they're trying to come up with, uh, solutions. Um, but that's not their primary thing, right? Like medical, like if you're a church, you probably should go down there to preach or something. If you want to do mission trips or send missionaries to preach. Um, the, my faith is a big part of why I did it. I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe that, uh, you know, I was just called to do it. It just is what it is. Um, doesn't mean everybody is, but I just happen to be. So what I think is what I wanted to do was create a solutions based organization run by faith filled people as opposed to a faith-based organization trying to come up with solutions. So I looked at it as two, as there was two pathways. You're either going to be a church that tries to heal people through medicine, 
which I didn't like. First of all, I'm not qualified to be any kind of preacher. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a tough job, really tough. I know um, Rob there at the Citadel is amazing. Um, I love him. Yeah, yeah he's, he's so smart. Um, I'm not, uh, he's, he's great. Yeah, Rob's dirty, I love him. Um, and, but, but, and then there's another pathway where like you have a solution, but you're driven by your faith. And that may be in whatever career you're in, you know, that could be on your personal life, whatever it is. And if you're driven by the faith and have a solution, that can be a business, you know? And so I wanted to set it up as a business to where if students at MUSC wanted to do rotations in Nicaragua, Uganda, whatever, uh, they would be able to do that through a state institution um, without a religious, you know, tie necessarily. Um, and they're going to know that the organization was set up uh, from people because of their faith, but they're in no way obligated to participate in that. And so there has to be short-term mission trips because if you don't take a short-term mission trip, you'll never really know how the other people live, right? Those of you who go in the military are going to know pretty quickly, obviously, when you're, if you're deployed or anything like that. But the rest of us, you know, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to see that. And so um, you have to do that, right? Because you got to make people, you got to make them understand. But in the other end, it has to marry into something long-term. So now our short-term mission trips, we still do take, um, and we take thousands, thousands of people, especially from USC. And then they always are in uh, uh, conjunction with our long-term hospitals. So they're always in catchment areas of our hospitals. Any patients need to be referred back to our hospitals can be referred back immediately. And all of our staff, all of our hundreds and hundreds of staff uh, in these countries are all natives. So there's no Americans there kind of running the ship. Um, we give them the infrastructure, the capital, put a business plan in place. We have a country director, but otherwise all nationals We're running our hospitals, all national doctors, nurses, top to bottom, everything, all of our hospitals. So, um, so in that regard, if I were to go away and the whole One World Health Organization were to dissolve overnight, these places could still run and still deliver care in a sustainable manner. Um, so that's kind of, that's how that happened. Um, so for example, now with COVID shutting down international travel, these hospitals throughout, is this mostly South America, Central America, where are you located, Africa? Central America and Africa, yeah. Okay, Central America and Africa, they're still operating. They're still, they have a country director and they have hospital and staff. Um, so these are actual physical locations, hospital, real hospitals that are, have been built by One World Health and staffed through a plan that One World Health seeds is that kind of i think of it like when i think it's sort of i don't know why it's easier to imagine a, a faith-based mission you know going down and building a church right. as opposed right. to a, a like you said a solutions-based organization filled with faith-driven people that goes down and helps them build their own hospital right. and staffing management basically a training right. operation right and so with, that's true and so for example our hospital and we, we've gotten some grants too we have uh, usaid united states aid international development organization We've gotten grants, like in our, I'll use our hospital in Uganda, for example, our main hospital, we have three, but our main one, we have, you know, uh, four surgical operating rooms. We have a pediatric ward and uh, you know, an adult ward. We have, we just got a USAID grant for a big radiology, x-ray and CT equipment. We have uh, Peace Corps volunteers full-time. We have public health housing for them. Um, we have an ambulance. I mean, it's a real, real hospital. Um, <laughs> the ambulance is donated by an oil company, actually. Uh, but uh, <laughs> take, take all the help you can get. Oh yeah, we'll take it. We'll take it. Um, you know what? What a terrific uh, demonstration of a path that life has opened to you and you've, you've you seized upon to apply your expert, your, your professional expertise, the core values driven by your faith, and solve problems for people around the world. I mean, I'm, really, my hat's off to you in that regard, and I think that's a that's a wonderful example for cadets. You know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be medical. It doesn't have to be faith-based. It could be um, something else. But the way that you have uh, driven your heart of service into action, I think, is um, really, really fantastic. And uh, I looked at One World Health online. It's, uh, it's really it's, it's wonderful what you're doing. <laughs> Thanks. So, well, Thanks. listen, and to be respectful of your time and uh, to make sure that uh, the video is short enough that cadets will uh, watch it from start <laughs> to finish. Um, <laughs> And stay focused. The, the, the question I like to wrap up these interviews with is, okay, imagine yourself back as that, uh, you know, senior in college in the classroom, like you said, not sure what the plan is. What do you wish you knew at that time that you know now through your, through your experience? What do you wish you know? What do you wish you knew then that you can tell them that they, they can, they can benefit from, from your experience and wisdom? Oh boy. I guess I would say, I don't know. I kind of rushed it. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I rushed through school and I rushed through 
trying to get to the next thing. And I'm probably still guilty of that. I would say, you know, you don't have to rush it. I'd, I'd say this generation is a little bit less at risk of rushing it um, because of COVID and some other stuff. But, but yeah, don't rush it and don't feel like you have to have all, all the answers, uh, you know, before you do, I think. Um, getting through with the Citadel, you'll, you'll have a big achievement under your belt. And also don't think, you know, because you don't have an MBA or you don't have a whatever that you can't accomplish what you want to do. I mean, I could never have accomplished One World Health without partners who weren't medical, for example. Um, so, so I would just say, you know, yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> and also look for open doors. I would say this, I, maybe I'll, I'll take that back. You can edit this out. Okay. I would say this, look for open doors, walk through the open doors is what I would say. I, I know I mentioned that earlier, but like if someone presents you an opportunity, you're not a hundred percent sure, but the other doors seem kind of cracked or half open and this one's wide open, you're probably going to have a good pathway there. I mean, I, so look for those things um, is what I would say. Um, I think that's, that's great advice. And what, what I'm hearing from you is, hey, uh, the, the, if the universe aligns and it shows you something that you're not expecting, you go <laughs> walk through that door. And also the, the thing that I will not edit out, which I think is really important, is you're talking about the importance of relationships. You know, it's not necessarily you leading a team. It's you and your peers. It's maintaining those positive uh, relationships in your life because uh, those things will, will benefit you all the way through as you, as you succeed and struggle and try and figure out what the right path is. Um, th th those, those are two great pieces of advice. And uh, again, hats off for all the great work you are doing in the world. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to have you here and, and introduce you to these cadets. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, sign off. Thank you. It's a pleasure.